So the topic I believe I'm here for is to give you an update on the uh, Region Ears outbreak that we've experienced uh, in our community. Uh, just for the public's uh, record, I'm going to read the latest release, which was on September 18th, uh, 2018, and this came from the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. Update number six on outbreak of Legionnaires disease associated with the area of Ashworth Avenue. Hold on a second. Max, you all set? I'm just going to look up, honestly. <laughs> well, we're trying to get He's photogenic. <laughs> Sorry, about that. Thank you. No, that's okay. Good catch. <laughs> with the area of uh, Ashworth Avenue at Hampton, New Hampshire. The New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, the US, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Town of Hampton are winding down their investigation into an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in Hampton, New Hampshire. A total of 18 individuals have been confirmed to have Legionnaire's disease associated with Ashworth Avenue and the surrounding area. There have not been any new individuals reported to the DHHS with, uh, with suspected or confirmed Legionnaire's disease since the hot tubs at the Sands Resort and the Harris Sea Ranch Motel were shut down the last week in August. The summary report is it was 18 uh, confirmed onset of illnesses were uh, June 10th of this year to August 26th, hospitalized with 16 and with one death resulting. The CDC has sent the DHHS the results of testing of the environmental samples taken from the Sands Resort and Harris Sea Ranch. Water samples taken from the Sands Resort hot tub have been found to be growing the same strain of Legionella bacteria that was isolated from the patient diagnosed with Legionnaire's disease and re reported staying at the Sands Resort. This suggests the hot tub at the Sands Resort as a source of Legionnaire's disease. Additionally, because early test results from multiple water and environmental samples at the Sands Resort showed Legionella contamination, the Sands Resort hired an environmental consultant to clean and monitor the water facility's water system. The Sands water system was cleaned the week of September 3rd, and the environmental consultant has collected the new water samples that are being tested at an independent laboratory to make sure the Legionella bacteria at the facility have been eliminated. The Legionnaire's disease risk to the public is reduced while the hot tub is closed and the water system is undergoing remediation. The absence of any new individuals with Legionnaire's disease since the closure of the hot tub suggests that the current health risk to the community is low. All environmental and water test results from the Harris Sea Ranch Motel hot tub have returned negative for Legionella. The absence of Legionella may be due to the very high levels of chlorination found in this hot tub at the time of sampling. So the Harris Sea Ranch Motel cannot be completely ruled out as a potential source of Legionnaire's disease. Not all people associated with this outbreak reported contact with the Sands Resort but the environmental assessment and test results have not revealed any other source of Legionnaire's disease outbreak. According to the CDC, Legionella can be found naturally in fresh water and environmental sources when introduced into a building's water system. It can grow and spread in devices such as hot, uh, hot water tanks, shower heads, and hot tubs that have not, well, have not been well maintained. This is why it is so important that building owners and managers take steps to reduce the risk of Legionella and keep the water in the building safe. And for, for more information on the Legion outbreak, please visit and that's the uh, DHH website uh, that we've had up on our town website. So that is the latest, and I believe it's probably going to be the final uh, yeah. documentation as far as press release comes from DHHS. Mary right. Louise. Uh, Chief, uh, next summer we'll roll around. Uh, <clears throat> is there a requirement? when you own an establishment that has a hot tub for the state to be aware of it, to inspect it, to... Yes, there how is. How does that work? That's through DES, and you are required, if you have a pool or a hot tub, to be registered with the state of New Hampshire for inspection. Problem is, uh, my understanding is that it is a very minimal staff that covers the entire, not just the entire region, the entire state for pool inspections. So they have a requirement that they can't fulfill. So you're stuck with this stuff. Well, I can't answer that. Coming up low. Well, I, uh, we right. can speculate on that to, as to whether this individual that's responsible for mm -hmm. doing those inspections is able to keep up. I can't answer that. That would, that would the commissioner of DES should probably mm -hmm. be posed with that question as to whether they need to, in, you know, increase mm -hmm. the number of people doing those inspections. But you still apparently have something on the books that is supposedly a mandate for these people operating um, businesses. Yep that have the hot tubs. So that's going to leave you with a problem if these things aren't being inspected or looked at. It's all going to go in your lap again. Um, 
not necessarily because the, the town does not have a requirement to inspect pools or hot tubs. That is strictly a state uh, mandate. Mm -hmm. So we don't have anybody that's trained or have right. the, the testing equipment to do that. So the only thing I could say is that I believe that this was a learning experience for everybody involved. Well, I hope so. And that I think we're more aware that as we grow and we see changes at the beach or anywhere in town, yep. that I think pretty much we all know now that when we see constructions that, that offer pools or hot tubs in their facilities, they'll be kindly reminded of a number, you know, we have the RPC meetings, um, mm -hmm. uh, the PRC meetings rather, and those type of meetings, those things are gonna be made aware to the builders or the people running these facilities. I just have a problem with having requirements, whether it's the town or the state, and then there's no enforcement. I couldn't and agree it with gives you more. You a I couldn't agree problem with you more. Too. Regina, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Chief. I think that hopefully yeah. this is a learning experience, and if there are like set regulations, whether or not they're enforced, maybe people can take a look at them and hopefully try to comply with them on their own. But I thank know. you for the report, Jim. Yeah, I just want to say thanks. You guys did a good job. The fire department did a good job. You worked with the CDC and yeah. the DHS. Yes. So that the town employees were there all the time assisting with the... We offered when this when, when uh, the manager contacted me uh, that first day, I believe it was Friday the 24th, we got right on the, uh, on the line with our, re our counterparts with DHHS. And keep in mind, the state of New Hampshire hasn't seen an outbreak of this magnitude in probably 15 to 20 years. Mm. Uh, we average about 30 cases a year in the entire state. We wound up with 18. Um, so this is, this is not a everyday occurrence in the state of New Hampshire. So when the, f the team was formulated, it was kind of, we're coming this from a all hazards, multidisciplined approach. We needed a place to work out of and we had the police station and the fire station right there. We offered to use our facilities yeah. to house these folks because truly wasn't a, a, we were there to assist. I mean, we were there to get them to where they needed to be, make the introductions, yeah. And, and use whatever uh, local ordinances we could to try to help the investigation move along. But keep in mind that this type of investigation is led by the health professionals. Mm -hmm. It was one of those weird things I was just, I research sometimes statute. Where, where does something like this belong? Is this, you know, we, we did it under emergency management because that seemed the natural place in the town of Hampton to put it. Mm -hmm. um, you go to bigger communities, you go to a Manchester or Nashua, they have code enforcement. They have folks um, that are health officers and they have a team. We don't have that because of the size of the community and the way we change gears so much. Yeah. The natural place to place, the, place this when it happened, talking to the manager and the chairman, was under emergency management because we're used to coming at problems using different assets from different levels of government uh, compared to, say, the health officer. Kevin does a great job and, and but as we all know with the growth work experience, he's a busy man. Um, and for him to try to take on something like this and coordinate this is really not what he's trained to do, whereas that's what we do. So Kevin's part of our emergency management team, so it's just a natural place to, to have it for the town of Hampton to work it out of. But different communities, it's different strokes for different folks. For us, that's where it really needed to go. Did a good job, both departments. Rick? All three departments. Yeah. So <clears throat> basically, um, even though um, the Harris Sea Ranch uh, name was put out there over and over again, they really had, they didn't have any uh, confirmed cases of Legionella disease coming from their place. Nothing confirmed. One of the problems is it's good and it's bad. When this first broke the news and people started hearing about it, people trying to be responsible went out. If you talk to the folks up at the uh, some of the uh, pool treatment places, they had a big sale. I mean, they had a big week as people went up and got chemicals and did everything they could mm -hmm. to try to clean up and remediate the problem If because mm -hmm. that was a wide area that it was reported to be in. Wow. So everybody in that area was trying to do the right thing and, and clean up and make sure if it was them, they were getting rid of the bacteria. But in that process, that can also stymie the investigation to actually zero it into where it was. So the Harris Sea Ranch, uh, again, the chlorination level was significantly higher than normal that would you, you would see in your own tub or a pool. Um, could there have been Legionnaire there? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, it wasn't it, found there when they it tested wasn't it. Found there. It wasn't found there when they tested it. Yeah, and it's unfortunate names get put out there. And the only thing I would caution people on, I know 
this has been a very troubling issue for a lot of people uh, in town that obviously litigation is ensuing um, that we would probably want to limit our commentary on that issue and at some point if we want to go into a non-public just some of the things I would have no doubt that at some point uh, some of the people sitting here me and the fire chief are probably going to be deposed by counsel for either side that's just the normal process when lawsuits are filed they they grab everybody and ask everybody what happened so I just I would be cautious about what we would comment on in an open meeting like yeah. this well I think that's that's where a lot of it came from it came from um, Facebook sites and things like that and it's really mm -hmm. a shame that you think that people do stuff like that without really knowing I, you know I, I try not to get too worried about that I, I know it doesn't help sometimes but when you when, when I first heard Legion Air, I mean, my, I was a kid when this first happened. I remember yeah. when it happened in Philadelphia, and it was a scary thing. Yeah. It was this new disease that could wipe everybody out. And now, you know, people still remember that. When you break it down to what it is and what it isn't, um, you know, that bacteria is everywhere. It's yeah. only when it gets aerosolized and you inhale it yeah. that it becomes dangerous to you. Um, but thinking of it in that context of, of how these things can happen, um, again, it was a very big learning lesson for all of us involved yeah. and uh, yeah. the one thing I did appreciate very much was the representatives including Commissioner Meyer from uh, DHHS and CDC folks uh, complimented the town that they had never seen support from the local entity on an investigation of this nature to the degree that they got from the town of Hampton wow. so that the work that uh, you folks allowed us to do in conjunction with them mm. did not go unnoticed. You know, well, I would caution people not to believe everything they see on those type of websites. I know that someone uh, put on there that I was closing my business and this and that and stuff oh, like that. It's, it's, yeah. it's not helpful, but people do. Yeah. Um, what about um, the uh, is there any um, something to it that if people don't keep their hot water heaters like their um, hot water heat settings high you want to keep your settings problem. high enough and I would refer everybody Ben again back to the DHH website there's great advice there on what you should be setting what your hot water should be coming out of the tap and then you can adjust the heat level in your hot water heater but yeah it, there's a certain temperature range where if you don't use the water and it just sits there at that temperature that bacteria can grow so that you know, there are standards that people could investigate yes. what they are yeah because I was noticing that they also had the same problem at the uh, veterans uh, hospital in Boston they yep. had Legionnaires yeah. the disease yeah. there too so it's a shame really thank you for the way you handled it I think you did an excellent job I think the team did an excellent job and you just shown us another reason why we should have code enforcement officers in this town yeah and that would be part of my recommendation to you as part of this whole uh, issue is that again with Kevin it, it, we did name three other deputy uh, health officers in the town myself the fire chief and the assistant building inspector but as we all know uh, very busy people we all wear multiple hats as it is mm -hmm. I think you know we really got to take a hard look at giving some doesn't have to I don't think it has to be a full-time person it could even be seasonal but somebody with a little more expertise than one of us to go out and give have Kevin a, a hand with those health code issues especially as we ramp up and we start closing down for our summer season I think it that would be very helpful Right. Just one more quick. Um, we are going to try to work with Channel 22 to see if we can get the notices, because you did have emergency yeah. notices there, mm -hmm. to see if we can get them in a format that's more easily read mm -hmm. for the members of the public. Because I, I know I had no. a lot of complaints. That no, we'll work with them to try to accomplish that. With it. Yeah. Second Thank thing you. you had on here was your uh, emergency management team. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I think there are a lot of people when these things occur don't have a full understanding of emergency management. I can tell you, I, I really didn't until I started moving up the ranks, and you you had to become part of drills and and learning how the system works. And I think in this particular case, we really had two different areas that we touched upon. The town of Hampton utilized emergency management because we have a strong team. We do the drills. We practice um, and the relationships are there so we can accomplish a lot in any given task but when you look at the um, you know and that's all covered under uh, RSA chapter 21 P and there's a lot of detail into what it is and when when you invoke emergency management generally speaking it's when there's a declared emergency by the governor the authority of an emergency management director 
is invoked and becomes the coordinator between the local and the state entity when things get beyond our ability yeah. to manage. There's nothing that prohibits the town from using the emergency management team and the director to a greater capacity, in which I think we do. I think uh, with a lot of issues where we're a little town, but we have big city problems on occasion, just because of the population yeah. and the things we deal with weather-wise yeah. with the beach, that we bring everybody to bear on it. We don't just say it's one entity handling it. We, we put a team together, we go out and we deal with the problems. We saw that when we had the storms, um, the flooding, uh, all of those type of issues, and now this most recent incident. This incident really would come under communicable disease, uh, RSA 141. When you do the research as to who technically is in charge of that situation, it, it would be uh, the commissioner, uh, Commissioner Meyer in that one. So having extra people appointed as health officers was very helpful, but they're also all part of the emergency management team. So I think we have to look at that moving forward as to what is in the best interest of the town considering who we are as a town. You can look around us at different communities and there's, di there's different variations of how they do it. If you look at the Seabrook uh, situation, they had a separate entity called emergency management. They just re recently merged that with the fire department, yet they still have a separate emergency management director working out of the fire department, mm. uh, Mr. Yeah. Tatone. If you go to Rye, um, you have an emergency management director that's a police chief. They have a team and they have a, uh, an assistant uh, emergency management director that's a civilian, a former town manager or uh, town administrator for that town. Mm. Is the deputy, he lives in town, uh, he's now a private citizen, private business, but he stayed, kept his connection uh, with the town in that capacity. Mm. So you see a, a variation of what emergency management is community to community. I think it's worth exploring here. I've had some preliminary discussions with people in town that might be interested. Some of the things that we can't do just because of our busy schedules and the, depart the, the department heads that we have, things like the, uh, the flood mitigation. Um, we, we have a, a number of calls every year because people suffer repetitive flooding lots. Yeah. That's really not an area as an emergency management director. I'm that versed in or have time to really explore for people. But there's nothing that says, you know, every community has to have an emergency management director, but there's nothing says that a, a emergency management director can't have a team or committee mm -hmm. working on those other issues that don't have to be current working professionals. They can be, you know, let's tap into our retirees. It's been a great resource for us. I mean, I look at the evidence, my evidence deck, Jim Mills. I mean, he's a retired postmaster, and he's done wonders in our evidence room. Uh, just a very meticulous, perfect person for that job. Um, I know of a number of people in the community that I believe the emergency management director should, at one point I thought it should be an independent issue. I think it still needs to be somebody, uh, one of the department heads, but there's nothing wrong with expanding that team mm -hmm. to bring some of these people in that have experience elsewhere in emergency management with the federal side, local, state. Uh, I believe there's somebody in town that used to be an emergency management director up at the uh, Portsmouth Navy Yard. That's somebody's experience I think we could draw on. Uh, if they're willing to help, uh, and I think they would be. In dealing with a lot of its paperwork, with emergency management, it's not always you're out there doing, it's the paperwork you need to follow up. You know, we're in the middle now with FEMA trying to recover some money from the storms. Mm -hmm. For Christie, for the department heads, that's, that's a cumbersome thing to go to those meetings and trying to get to that line where they're going to say, okay, yeah, we're going to reimburse you. Those are the time-consuming things, uh, and again, I'm running a police department, you know, Jamie's running a fire department. It, it's trying to do that on top of that can be difficult. So I think it might be time to start looking at that. The other recommendation I'm making is, in my time, we've had a, a budget of $1,000. That really isn't realistic. It, we spend far more than that. We just take it from other budgets where we have to. You know, with the police department, for utilizing them. What I'm recommending is that every year, because of our participation in the Seabrook drills, we get quarterly payments that add up to just over $12,000 a year. I'm recommending that in the budget for uh, emergency management, we put that sum into that line item. It's money we're receiving from the state anyhow for our participation, but that would just give us uh, a little more leeway dealing with things and a little bit less of robbing people <coughs> to pay Paul from the different budgets. Mm -hmm. So, any questions? It's, it's a Good thing we're having this discussion. It wasn't very nice having legionnaires come to town, 
but it's provoked us into, I think, a very worthwhile discussion. I appreciate what you've said, Chief. Thank you, Regina. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate the discussion as well, and I would hope that maybe we could take some of the Chief's recommendations into consideration in the near future to mostly provide support for already very busy department heads. As we work on the budget, we'll have to remember all this stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's the only thing people got to remember. You know, we, we, right. we have some deficiencies, but I think we do a pretty good job, but if we're going to improve, it is going to be a funding issue. Did want to drop out. Uh, we have one of we've been working, uh, trying to secure some vehicles that we can get into those high waters with so we're not running our, our fire engines and cruisers through them. Mm -hmm. uh, we did secure one, a uh, two and a half ton vehicle that we're working to get into uh, down to the PD probably the ne uh, beginning of next week. We should have that in of our inventory. So mm -hmm. we'll at least have one to get, get through the winter and the hurricane season and the storms and we'll work on another one. Very good. John, you got Good. Rick? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you.